Good afternoon, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook in discussion for Tuesday, September 13th, 2016. Interesting area developing here along the Florida coastline, Invest Area 93L, Hurricane Center now giving it a 40% chance of development. Basically, if this system was 50 to 100 miles offshore, we would be looking at a tropical storm headed towards the Florida coastline. Looking at the uh, satellite animation of it, the wider perspective, you can see it located right here, just near the Cape Canaveral, Daytona Beach area. Most of the heaviest of the weather on the east side of the system, over the water, the very warm water of the western Atlantic. Here's a close-up shot, and you can see that pretty decent area of convective activity near to the center here. Uh, decent outflow over here to the right side. Kind of limited on the left side of the system overall. And uh, if you look at the geographic makeup of the area. You have Orlando sitting in here, Jacksonville, St. Augustine up in this area, uh, Melbourne, Florida down here, Daytona, Ormond Beach in this area. So really this is confined to the east coast of Florida and maybe right along the I-95 corridor, areas inland along I-4, I-75, and of course extending over towards the Tampa-St. Pete area, up through Cedar Key, etc., no real problems with this system because it is generally east weighted meaning again that it's obvious most of the activity is out over the east here it's not symmetrical yet and they say that it's moving off to the north northwest looking at the latest satellite uh, this being a radar animation sorry uh, maybe it's moving north northwest it's kind of hard to see but you know these rotating sort of sort of onshore uh, this rotating around the low pressure area, I guess the whole thing is moving off to the north northwest, and the rotation of it gives the illusion that it's moving back out over the water. But you never know with these systems when they're moving this slow, they tend to want to stay where the warm water is. I mean, they're not living creatures, but you know, if if they can maybe get a foot in the water and the convection builds there. They try to sometimes move. I've seen weird things, just put it that way, all right? So, uh, and this may be no exception, but at least, as I pointed out, over the uh, big population centers, Orlando and the resort areas, uh, even up towards St. Augustine, although this weather is closing in on you, uh, Ocala, Tampa, St. Pete, no problems from this system as most of the heaviest weather remaining offshore. So this will be something to watch. They mentioned, the Hurricane Center does, that perhaps advisories would be initiated later today. Wouldn't that be something? And they say that there are tropical storm force winds being detected, I guess, via radar out of Melbourne uh, in the system. So maybe it would be tropical storm Julia, even if only for 12 to 18 hours. You know, we've seen this happen before, and it didn't get a name where something blew up right off the coast. So something to watch closely, especially... And here's I-95 coming down out of Jacksonville, uh, especially if you're heading down the I-95 corridor from roughly Jacksonville to just south of Melbourne. And some of these other storms loosely related to the system. Uh, this will be interesting to watch. If it does get a name and it happens to try to stay offshore, heck, I can be down there in six or seven hours, go down there tomorrow and get some observations. We'll see. Could be interesting. Looking at the wider perspective as to what's going on, there's Ian. No worries about it. It's going to head on out farther into the North Atlantic. This is Invest Area 95L. Probably will fall apart in the weird graveyard of the main development region. Uh, it's like the walking dead out there for tropical waves, I'm telling you. Unbelievable how these systems are so well organized. And we look at the analyses and we say, okay, Vertical instability through here, vertical wind shear overall has been favorable for these systems, yet they're falling apart. This dry layer of the atmosphere that is not related to the Saharan air layer and the typical ways that we see these things sort of dry out, they're not moving west at 25 knots. Something really weird is going on, and it may take a while to try to figure out what it is, but uh, in any case, we'll watch this system now, these are the Cape Verde Islands, now referred to as the Cabo Verde Islands. I don't know when that name changed. i got to look into that. I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, but this will be passing through that region, bringing some gusty winds. 
And generally, computer models bring this to the West over time, but they don't really strengthen it. So you know, we'll see. Another zombie system out there kind of limping along, slowly fading back to oblivion because they don't seem to develop. Now, where there is something absolutely phenomenal, uh, when you see this, you say, you know what, it is absolutely spectacular, and it certainly is a shame that they have to hit land because when you see something this round, and this perfect in nature and weather, it is really a marvel. And uh, when they hit land, they become terrifying, and they have you know the associated impacts. Uh, there's a little island right in here. Don't know the name of it off the top of my head. In the southern eye wall of this super typhoon, super typhoon, super typhoon Maranti, or something like that. Uh, 185 mile per hour sustained winds around a very small, tightly compacted core and a large wind field associated with it, uh, scraping the southern end of Taiwan here. And luckily, this will pass more than likely just to the south. In fact, I can show you the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, center uh, forecast track. And it's interesting, this is where the initial position was. And then this is that little island right there in the forecast. It was very short term, obviously. Had it going just north of that island, and we can look at the satellite shot. And that verified pretty nicely, didn't it? It's always good to see when the forecast track verifies. And hopefully, it'll verify staying just south of the southern tip of Taiwan here. Now, this is a great example of it. When I say it, it would be the eye, the center. That's what the track forecast is showing, the center of the typhoon moving south of the tip of Taiwan. Now, you know, as well as I do, that this area in here underneath the central dense overcast is he very heavy rain, uh, very strong winds, and all of this will get closer. So you have to take that whole sort of ball of convection here and move that along the path. And you think about what's inside of there and how close that's going to get to southern Taiwan. And it shows you, you know, that just tracking the center, you know, anybody that says, oh, good, that little symbol there. That's the typhoon. It's not going to hit Taiwan. Well, you're wrong. Uh, those strong easterly winds are going to come in, high waves, 100 mile per hour winds. I mean, the worst of it is absolutely near the core, but this is a great example in their wind field expansion here, showing the areas of the different quadrants where the different gale force and hurricane force winds extend show that. But again, this satellite picture, this is a fine example that just because the center is going to miss doesn't mean that the effects will be negligible. They're going to be something else. And um, we'll be watching for that on Twitter, the different social media information coming out. James Reynolds, Earth Uncut TV. James Reynolds, find him on Twitter. Phenomenal updates. Uh, great passion for the work that he does. And he is there in southern Taiwan. James Reynolds, find him on Twitter and watch what he is reporting. He's very good at it and we'll give you some accurate and uh, detailed information. He's there. He lives in Hong Kong, and he's able to travel all over that area of the world investigating volcanoes and these massive typhoons. So I uh, wanted to just kind of throw back a little bit to eight years ago. Uh, Hurricane Ike made landfall on this date in the early morning hours of September 13th. Uh, in 2008, I was there with my colleague Michael Watkins, Ike made it across the entire Atlantic Basin here and went across the Greater Antilles and into southeast Texas as a Category 2 hurricane. You may remember this. These are some of the pictures that I took. The seawall protected most of the beachfront of Galveston, where there is seawall protection, down on the west end. Bermuda Beach, Jamaica Beach, I think that's what it's called, and areas where there is no seawall. They had some damage and the loss of homes. Of course, Bolivar Peninsula to the north was almost completely decimated. A few homes remained, but it was very devastating for that area, mainly because of the storm surge. Nevertheless, there's uh, yours truly setting up the wind tower here, five meter wind tower. Uh, this is what feeds into our app. We didn't have an app back then. I wish we had, but hey, the iPhone was only a year old at this point. Isn't that hard to believe? But that's what our wind tower looks like, and hey, you never know. I might be going down and setting one of those up for maybe Julia tomorrow. That's going to be really interesting to see. But back to Ike, 
here I am setting up the wind tower. Uh, this is what it looked like from our hotel. That is the Gulf of Mexico. No, that's not photoshopped in any way. These are the massive swells that were sent out well ahead of Hurricane Ike. And this is still probably eight hours from landfall here. And the Gulf reached almost the level of the seawall, which runs right there. That's the seawall. And the Gulf almost made it to the top of the seawall and nearly overtopped it. The bay, Galveston Bay, worked its way in from behind Galveston and flooded areas like the Strand. And uh, a good deal, probably two-thirds of the island, went underwater. There's Mike, Mike Watkins, setting up our old version of the storm surge cams. That box weighed almost 100 pounds. It had a laptop, a couple of huge batteries, and a bunch of other stuff to make the live video feed work. And I'm going to show you what that looked like real quick. Hopefully this will work. This is the actual video from that system. No audio back in the day, and the picture was 4 by 3 a square. Now everything's better quality. But look at that surge coming in. This is the storm surge headed in uh, from Hurricane Ike. You can see the debris in the water. Just a nasty, nasty setup. Kind of fast forward a little bit here. You get an idea. Look at all that energy coming in, the flooding all that debris in the water. This was a great example back in the day of our uh, project. Uh, unfortunately, it weighed a lot and it only ran for about 18 hours. Now we get 30 hours runtime. We have audio. And I mean, you saw it during our Cedar Key Hurricane Hermine coverage. Come quite a long way since that setup there. Uh, this is the day after. This is a graveyard, obviously, kind of a haunting picture here. Uh, this is storm surge. This isn't rainwater. Storm surge flooding from Galveston Bay, very surrealistic when you see the aftermath of these systems. Also, not to be outdone, on the same date <clears throat> in 2007 was Hurricane Umberto. Remember that one? It went from basically a tropical depression to a Cat 1 in 19 hours, making landfall near High Island, Texas, and uh, caught people by surprise very much so unfortunately one person lost their life in this very small but quite potent hurricane made it up to about 85 miles per hour I believe well they say 90 right there so I guess it was adjusted I didn't even have time to get there myself I mean that would have been a great opportunity but to get to High Island from North Carolina is a pretty good haul and in 19 hours I wouldn't have made it even if I had a crystal ball and knew ahead of time it wasn't enough time. So this time of the month during hurricane season, uh, a lot of different anniversaries, but I wanted to show you specifically Ike there because I was there on this date eight years ago. All right, well, I will keep an eye on what's happening with 93L, and if it does manage to stay just offshore and become a tropical storm, I might very well consider heading down there tomorrow. Six-hour drive, no big deal. Give you some surface observations from the area if it stays inland. And we'll just wait and see. So check the blog tomorrow and we'll see what happens. You can follow on social media as well. I'm on Twitter at Hurricane Track. All right, well, that's it for me for today. I am Mark Sutter for HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. And one way or another, I'll have another video blog for you tomorrow, either from the office or maybe on the road. You never know. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. We'll talk again tomorrow.